The following video was requested by my patrons. Thank you again for your continued support. To help this channel, check out my links in the description below or at the end of this video. Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. The world of Watch Dogs depicts an alternate Earth, where technology has even more enveloped our lives. Most if not every electronic system that could connect to the internet does, and in the city of Chicago, as well as other major metropolitan areas such as San Francisco in later games, all devices are connected to an intranet infrastructure network called CTOS, Central Operating System or City Operating System, depending on who you ask. With CTOS, users with access to the control systems had virtually unlimited access to every electronic device connected. This included things like, but probably not limited to, blockers and road spikes, bridge access, the electric grid, street and traffic lights, subway trains and public transportation, underground and above ground steam pipes, hospitals, crime prediction system, security cameras, ATMs and bank accounts, TVs, personal information including medical records, cell phones and phone calls, facial recognition, Internet-connected devices, from computers to smart thermostats or even smart fridges, power transformers, lighthouses, vehicles, and so much more. So basically, Chicago was retrofitted with this gigantic, centralized computer system with control over just about every electronic device. The operation of anything, including machinery, connected to the internet, from the wells in people's houses, traffic lights, and operation of security cameras under the absolute dominion of whosoever has control of the network. Everything, from the raising of drawbridges to the running of specific ads on TV, is all just a push of a button away. I'm hoping a bunch of you guys watching can already guess what a horrible idea CTOS is. If you're even passingly familiar with Watch Dogs, you know the game's gimmick is your ability to hack the city and use the city itself as your weapon. The way it works is CTOS has several backdoor viruses, which is just technobabble for how anyone with knowledge of the security system's vulnerabilities have unlimited access to the network. So me suggesting that CTOS is a horrible idea isn't poisoning the well, it's the premise of the game. So just how realistic is CTOS and could such a system exist either today, later, or in a voluntary society? Well, let's break it down. CTOS is a flawed system, not only because, as the game's premise suggests, anyone with backdoor access to the network can gain control of the system, but arguably, so could anyone with the legitimate use or need of the network. A humble retail store worker in Chicago would need CTOS to do their job. Their terminal and cash register is, no doubt, connected, so they would have to be trained on how to use it to perform their job functions. And this isn't just in retail, but in traffic control, transportation, energy, utilities, healthcare, marketing, communications, finance, to name but a few. All will no doubt require interfacing with CTOS in some capacity, somewhere, and some time. The problem is that once any employee has a login, they essentially have unlimited access to the entire network and all it would take for an office employee to get revenge for having to skip vacation due to unusual workload on his boss is to mark said boss as a wanted person on the database. Their surveillance network and Chicago police will take care of the rest. But wait, I hear you say. If he's an office employee, that surely he only has access to CTOS insofar as he needs it to do his job, and is thus locked out of any of its other higher functions. If that were true, then there would be safeguards already in place that would isolate sectors of the economy from each other. So a hotel auditor can't just operate ATMs remotely. For example, the internet you're using to watch this video right now is partitioned off such that your ability to watch me doesn't give you access to my bank account. If such safeguards were in place in CTOS, then hackers would have a much harder time operating CTOS-connected property, 
as each hacking attempt would be thwarted at the login screen, even if the main character of the game had administrative privilege and thus unlimited access to CTOS because he's an uber elite hacksaw, he would still need to log in constantly. The only alternative is restricted accounts, where any one person's login credentials only gives them access to a specific and very narrow set of permissions with which they can interface with CTOS. Permissions offer a perfectly reasonable justification for all of this, and a good safeguard against revenge by disgruntled tech-savvy employees. However, this also falls apart when one remembers the sheer scale of CTOS. It's in everything, and that's no exaggeration. Each industry, and sets of firms, and firms individually, will be connected, each having their own individual wants, needs, and preferences. And the needs of employees to do their jobs will differ as well. High-class restaurants, for example, will not only need to be able to log guests, process cards, and manage inventories, but also access people's cars as some form of automated valet. That will require sets of permissions for certain people, potentially dozens, and that is just for one industry. Even in that industry, there's discretion between what permissions are preferred for your position within that firm. Managers must have completely different permissions than waiters, for example, and even between individual firms, they may require separate permissions. Restaurant A might have one manager, while restaurant B has three, who each work different shifts and have different responsibilities. So although one solution might be to create a set of permissions depending on your occupation, it's simply going to impose a one-size-fits-all solution to a dynamic and ever-changing workplace. Restaurants are just one type of business among hundreds of goods and services a business could sell, among the many thousands of competing firms in the city of Chicago alone. The number of permissions needed for CTOS to be secure is absolutely ludicrous. Whitelisting permissions, that is to say all users are, by default, banned from using CTOS in any capacity unless given explicit permission in the network to do very narrow and specific actions might otherwise solve this. But this army of permissions has so many points of failure, it could break down very easily. People's permissions will need to be adjusted constantly as people change jobs, are promoted or demoted. There's a systematic shakeup with how firms are run, all which need to be manually changed and changed constantly. The endless number of adjustments will create employment for people whose sole purpose it is to administer these permissions, but these are still going to be as prone to human error as anything else. Since CTOS is all about efficiency, the use of permissions seems pointless. If they are dead set on uniting every sector of city infrastructure and the economy into a single, monolithic centralized network. The more eagle-eyed of you might have noticed that among CTOS's applications are crime reduction systems. They are what they sound like, a repository of knowledge about someone, their habits, their routines, and an analysis by an AI that calculates the likelihood of their committing a crime when and where. Basically, they're going full minority report on this one, except in minority report, they would just arrest you for doing nothing wrong yet. Now, they know where you're going at all times and could empty your bank account at will. They probably have access to your credit cards. They could block you from buying things that they wanted, and because they control ATMs, you can't withdraw cash either. So you can imagine being blacklisted from society, all because some AI said you might commit a crime in the next two minutes, or because you look at some government employee wrong. You don't even need to do that. The disgruntled employee from earlier can just do this to their boss, since there's clearly no safeguards in place. You can liquidate people's life savings, stop them from getting into their car, trap them behind a red light for all eternity. One's capacity to ruin someone else is limited only by the imagination of a sadist. And because law enforcement relies on CTOS to find their suspects, the burden of proof 
is unjustly shifted to individuals who could be false flagged by a particularly nasty hacker, thus creating a guilty until proven innocent justice system where you have to prove to law enforcement why you showed up on the database in error. Whatever horror stories you could come up with, the point is that the CTOS system is ripe for abuse. So how did CTOS come into existence? The network was developed by Bloom Corporation, who are, in their own words, the world's foremost innovator of high-tech, high-performance communications and security technology. They make operating systems for smartphones and computers, in addition to image recognition and security. So there's some combination of Microsoft, a bit of IBM, and Blackwater, I guess. I don't know why. But the important part is that they're a big tech company that is basically a composite of the entirety of Silicon Valley, with all that implies. Bloom Corporation spent an unspecified amount of time developing CTOS. Since details are sparse, information such as how much it cost to develop and how long it took are not known. But we can make some guesses. According to the Seattle Times, it cost Microsoft $10 billion to develop Windows Vista, and that's just on payroll costs alone. Figure the actual cost, including capital, is, say, $50 million, in 2005 dollars, roughly speaking. However, CTOS is vastly more complex than Windows Vista, requiring not only compatibility with, but functionality on an absurd number of devices all of which must be able to communicate with each other in real time. CTOS isn't just a computer operating system or a phone operating system. It's also a tablet OS, a printer OS, an ATM OS, a car OS, a security camera OS, a security alarm OS, a traffic control OS, a thermostat OS, yeah, you get the idea. This guarantees the cost of development will skyrocket. Even worse, is that with all of this universal device interoperability, the OS will still need to be able to interface with an even larger variety of non-CTOS devices, adding yet another layer of complexity. A project of this magnitude has to cost trillions. Even Silicon Valley would struggle to come up with those kinds of resources, let alone justify to investors just how the hell they can spend 10-25% to of annual US economic output to build one thing. The only way it could possibly be done is with government assistance. I'm talking lots and lots of government subsidies, both in tax rebates as well as direct loans and grants from both federal and state governments, as well as direct assistance in government employees from places like NASA lending their expertise to the CTOS project. Even with all this help, it would still be difficult to justify this kind of expense without some guarantee by the federal government, some form of investment guarantee, where if the project doesn't quite work out, the state will compensate Bloom Corporation. Much like how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had the financial risk of subprime loans they guaranteed paid for by the federal government prior to the 2008 housing crash. Investment guarantees and aid from government scientists are forms of government subsidies. Let's just be clear about that. On a side note, where are Bloom's competitors? No, not in the bloated centralized operating system industry, but in everything else Bloom produces, which is also lacking in details. They market themselves as leaders in communications, so I have to assume they work in software. That's why I said they're like Microsoft earlier. But the question remains, where's their competition? Even in a corporatist economy, where the state raises barriers to entry favoring established ugliopolis like Microsoft, big businesses still see competition. So where are they? I think the answer lies with Bloom's own size. They're enormous. Why aren't they just drowning in antitrust legislation, you might be asking? Well, your first mistake was assuming that antitrust legislation is not applied arbitrarily. To complete the Microsoft metaphor, Microsoft was hit with antitrust legislation in the 90s after their browser became dominant in the web browsing industry. 
a process that went on for years and mysteriously ended after Microsoft began to fork over millions of dollars in campaign donations and lobbying fees. Who's to say the same wasn't true for Bloom Corporation? Or they were able to avert that completely by getting in cozy with the state? Their investments paying off, getting legislation and other restrictions that had the effect of banning their competition passed into law, creating a monopoly in the truest sense of the word. Now that we've established how Bloom operates, how did CTOS get installed into Chicago? Remember how connected and widespread it is. Literally every street corner is connected in some way, so we can infer that Bloom would not only need the consent of city government to install their stuff on the streets, they would also need the permission of property owners to install CTOS onto all of their devices. Though in order for the situation in the game to function as it is, namely everything, that could be connected to CTOS is they need 100% consent from everyone in the city of Chicago to have their device connected in addition to their consent of being surveilled and their information archived. Something that just isn't possible. Whether it's some people who rightfully think that having their devices connected to a huge centralized database is a bad idea, people who don't think it would help their businesses or even simple curmudgeons, who will refuse for seemingly irrational reasons. But for whatever reason, getting 100% agreement among all property owners isn't possible. So how did Bloom get all of those people to consent? The simplest answer might be that they paid them off, but even if Bloom were willing to pay out a few billion or more so to those who would refuse, including those who refuse with the intent on being bought out, It's not the likely solution. I think the real answer is that they didn't get people's consent. They do what I've demonstrated their want to do, and go to the government, using eminent domain laws to forcibly install CTOS onto people's devices without their consent, violating property rights. It's for the greater good, you see. It's even more than that, actually, because cell phone service and bank accounts all of which fall under CTOS Aegis, aren't all headquartered in Chicago. There are several internet service providers, dozens of cellular providers, and literally thousands of banks in the U.S., all across the U.S. and around the world. Bloom would have to make a deal with all of them, and that's only in three industries. Or else have the government force these private businesses to allow CTOS to be imposed on their customers such that for being in a geographic location the government unilaterally decided must have CTOS, you are now immediately part of the network, whether you want to be or not. Even if you're just visiting relatives or passing through. If you set foot in the city of Chicago in this world, you are going to be watched, tracked. Every aspect of your life, every word you type on a keyboard, every web page you browse will all be archived, on a single, centralized database, and all with neither your consent or your knowledge. So let's summarize here. In order to make a city more efficient, Bloom Corporation developed CTOS, the construction of an operating system whose scope and interoperability with a cornucopia of devices would have to cost trillions of dollars, something you could only justify to investors if shouldered by taxpayers and the state the same state who violated property rights through eminent domain in order to get CTOS implemented in the first place. It can watch people and record their every move in action. This is all reprehensible enough, but we're not done yet. You see, CTOS is a huge financial risk for Bloom. We've already established that the cost for the project is prohibitive, and I have no clue how Bloom Corporation plans to get that money back as it's unclear how CTOS generates revenue. It's a big gamble on a huge project that doesn't have any obvious revenue streams. Bloom put all of their political goodwill and corporate resources into a single basket. They are all in, baby, and their success or failure as a company must surely rise and fall depending on the success or failure of CTOS. 
but by any standard of measurement, CTOS has been an unmitigated, unrelenting failure. I mean, don't get me wrong. In terms of what CTOS set out to do, it's fantastic. L trains in Chicago are on time, commute times are lower, and they've implemented Google's business model of eyeballs to ads on a citywide scale, involuntarily. But then we run into our old friend, unintended consequences. Unintended consequences, like everyone in Chicago having their personal information consolidated into a single centralized database. Much like how a kidnapper has a responsibility for the health of their victim, Bloom has a fiduciary responsibility for making sure all the data being collected doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Problem is, any mechanical engineer can tell you the more moving parts in a machine, the more points of failure. The same principle is true for networks. A massive number of access points to a network means a massive number of points of failure in security. Congratulations, Bloom Corporation. You just created every cyber terrorist and cyber criminal's wet dream. Whether or not it could be vulnerable to security breaches is a foregone conclusion. Organizations such as DedSec make it a point to hack CTOS to advertise their protests against CTOS, while less scrupulous organizations like Prime8 rely on it to carry out their shenanigans. One disillusioned former developer of the system hacked CTOS to show how dangerous it was to the public, accidentally causing 11 deaths. While those deaths are terrible, nobody in setting ever asked the question how this is allowed to happen. This kind of stuff should be on primetime news. People should be marching in the streets, demanding to know why these flagrant breaches of their privacy can continue to happen. Constant data breaches from Bloom failing its fiduciary responsibility should scare people of their personal information being leaked. Banks will wonder why their clients' deposits keep vanishing inexplicably. People, terrified as to whether or not a hacker will explode a nearby transformer or steam pipe nearby to kill them. There will be a mass exodus of people from Chicago and anywhere else that's implemented CTOS as property values will plummet. Shareholders in Bloom Corporation will be up in arms, screaming for the CEO to explain why the company put trillions of dollars into a failure of a product. The conclusion they must come to is that CTOS is an unmitigated disaster. Bloom stocks should collapse. CTOS should go down in history as the costliest business mistake of all time. Even making failures like New Coke and the AOL Time Warner merger disaster look tame by comparison. By any standard of measurement, the events of the first game should have turned Bloom Corporation into the absolute laughingstock of the business world. The fact that that didn't happen and that CTOS was implemented in yet more cities is extremely suspicious. Someone wanted these things covered up. The public not to be made aware of the events that should have been the utter ruin of Bloom. But we have already demonstrated that for them to do what they do, Bloom would have to be in cozy with the state. So it's entirely possible that the government-controlled media downplayed Bloom's embarrassment, casting blame on the hackers directly while ignoring CTOS's legions of vulnerabilities that enabled this to happen in the first place as well as giving CTOS favorable news coverage when they can to manipulate the public's perception of the network. But now the question is, what is the state's interest in all this? Well, we're coming full circle here. What is CTOS? It's an operating system that gives its users virtually unlimited access to all public and private infrastructure connected to the system, including bank accounts, security cameras, vehicles, public transportation, and so, so much more. The state will always necessarily become more authoritarian, so to have a private company commission the creation of a surveillance state and police state, the likes of which even George Orwell in 1984 couldn't conceive of, one that can control your movements, your spending, what you see on the internet, if people can work, if they can get utilities, have a bank account, 
yeah, that's all CTOS is. A tool for the state to control people, and useful only to central planners. Useful to Adam Smith's man of system, whose conceit is thinking he knows how society ought to be structured, convincing himself of all the justification he needs to coerce other people to conform to his blueprints. Though you'll probably never see this discussed in any Watch Dogs games in the future, sadly. The setting is built around the cyberpunk genre, which makes it a point to vilify evil corporations as a proxy for the free enterprise system. Bloom Corporation will always be the bad guys, and the state's role in enabling and even facilitating their ascension will continue to go unexamined and unremarked upon. The implication being we need the savior state to write in and save the day, even if they caused the mess in the first place. So the original question, could CTOS or Bloom Corporation exist? In a statist, corporatist society? Possibly. We have Google and Facebook today, both of which are heavily subsidized by the government. None of them are building city-wide operating systems to the best of my knowledge. For good reason, as explained earlier, such a cost is too prohibitive, even for the US government. But could it exist in a voluntary society? No. The long answer? Given that it's the state that facilitated Bloom's rise, gave them a de facto monopoly in their industries, and facilitated the creation of CTOS, in the absence of the government, this is beyond unlikely. The only reason it could possibly exist is if enough customers wanted it, and even so, no group will be justified in imposing a hypothetical voluntary CTOS on people. The havoc, those on the fringes of society, or even just bored or disgruntled clerks could wreak on voluntary CTOS would dissuade most people of these preferences for a highly centralized network quite swiftly. The only way a system like CTOS could exist is in the realm of fiction, as it's too expensive for the state and too impractical for a voluntary society. The future of networking is decentralization, and there's not a thing governments or government-sponsored corporations can do about it. So what they should do is figure out what they're going to do in the new economy, and maybe they'll realize that they should go out and get real jobs! Questions? Comments? Critique? Do you think CTOS has any hope in our real world? How do you think I did on my analysis? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.